Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of the YouTube Creators Hub podcast, where I sit down with content creators, specifically YouTubers, who uh, I believe have been very successful on the platform, and I chat with them about kind of what makes them tick, their failures, the different strategies they've used to kind of get to where they are as creators. We bring on small creators, large creators, all shapes and sizes, uh, and I do believe we have one of the best informative shows on the internet, and this week is no different. We are joined today by Ken Carruth from The Fourth Ken over on YouTube. He's a 21-year-old barber and content creator, uh, has almost 300,000 subscribers on his YouTube channel, The Fourth Ken, and he's almost uploaded 600 videos. How are you doing today, Ken? I'm doing well. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So the fourth Ken, as I just mentioned, you're a barber, but you've decided to take that, the skill set you have, and translate it and incorporate it into your YouTube channel. So give me the story. What's the backstory or the origin story of the fourth Ken YouTube channel? How did it come to be? It's funny because it started in school. I was in eighth grade. It was for a school project. So we were instructed to basically make a video of us doing something that we're passionate about. Obviously, I'm passionate about cutting hair. I was just starting out. I was 13, 14. And I didn't quite know how to like upload a file to where I was supposed to drop in the school project. So I asked my teacher, I said, hey, can I just put it on YouTube and then just send you the link? He said, yeah, sure, do it. So I did it, and here we are. <laughs> and here we are. I love it. Now, uh, tell the audience the types of videos that, that you're putting on, on your channel. Like, if they were to go to the channel right now, what kinds of videos are, are you uploading? I upload, um, I like to call it feel-good, satisfying men's hair content. So haircuts, uh, occasionally I'll review clippers and things related to barbering, but I like to keep it to where it's like a relaxing environment, satisfying videos where I'm just cutting men's hair, big transformations. Right, and the well, I, I've watched these before on your channel specifically, which is kind of how I found you and other creators who basically bring in someone, uh, sometimes homeless people or people who can't afford haircuts, and they transform them from kind of like a woolly mammoth. You know, they have all this mm -hmm. hair all over their neck and their head, and then they do this haircut, and by the end of the video, they, they're this good-looking uh, you know, a person. And it's just such a cool thing how the transformative art of like, you know, a haircut can really do that to a person. And I feel like you capture that. What's been the reaction from other people in the space of like, you know, barbers? What what are their responses to you being on YouTube? Um, I have a, I have a lot of colleagues in the space. Um, we all support each other. I, I'd like to say there's like different types of YouTube barbers. You got like that educational form where it's like just tutorials, just teaching. Then you have kind of the entertainment form. Mm -hmm. I like to kind of mix both so that I can appeal to any audience. So when you get kind of too educational, you're just kind of pertaining to just barbers. I don't want barbers to be my audience. I want anyone to be right. my audience. Right. That way they can see it. Now, when it comes to growing a channel, you know, you're almost 600 videos in, you've got hundreds of thousands of subscribers, so you're obviously doing something correct. You're doing something right. Uh, what are a few things that you can look back on on your journey thus far and say, yeah, these are a few things that I could attribute my success to? Getting an editor was big for me. Um, I got an editor in the beginning of 2023, and... The reason that helped me is it allowed me to kind of brainstorm more content ideas, kind of have someone to kind of bounce my ideas off of. Mm -hmm. When I was just recording and editing and not to mention cutting hair, that's that's a lot on one person. That's too much at times. So getting an editor and he really just edits my videos. I still handle the thumbnails, the titles. That was probably my best decision in regards to YouTube besides starting it. And how did you find this editor and what do you pay them? So it's funny because the editor found me. It was very odd. So I was searching, searching, searching. I even experimented with some editors. Um, they were even on the pricey side. They just didn't get me. Mm -hmm. They didn't understand me. This guy, basically I found him through a mutual editor that we both knew. 
but my editor now, he was just kind of like a, a photo editor. So he was doing some of my thumbnails, like my reaction thumbnails. So he reached out. He said he could do a thumbnail for me. I liked his style. He listened and he understood me. And then we just built a relationship. So that's how it started. He found me. What's it like working with an editor? What's the workflow like now as far as when you used to do it all by yourself? Now you have someone working kind of in tandem with you on these videos. So what is that? Give me your whole process, like from like conception to upload. Oh, so I record a video. I pretty much already have the idea that I'm going to go with. So kind of like how you alluded to in the beginning when they come in like a, a, a mammoth. If it's a lot of hair, I already know, all right, we need to capture all the hair coming off. So while I'm recording and cutting, I try and get an image with uh, within the video that I can use as a thumbnail. I shoot the uh, video over to him through Google Drive. He edits it. I come up with the thumbnail, and then we both brainstorm the title. And then okay. it's then it's up. And, and if you don't mind sharing, like what's an average that you may pay him per video or is it, is it per month or hourly can, you know, retainer, what's the payment structure like? It's monthly retainer right now. I think I have him at eight. It depends like between like 800 and a thousand, which is very cheap. Mm -hmm. I don't want anyone watching this to think that that's common. It's very rare. Um, usually like a commercial editor with the agency is going to be much expensive. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I've looked into them. I have some folks helping me on the podcasts, and and I I do podcast production through my team as well. So I kind of know what that what that looks like. And so with that being the case, you're definitely getting a good deal. So that's great. You better hang on to him. Yes. Um, as far as storytelling, how important is it for your videos of telling the story of this person that comes in with their hair looking a certain way and then you kind of transforming the way they look and the way they feel? Is that something you implement into your videos and do you believe it to be kind of uh, important to the success of kind of where your channel's gone? Absolutely, 100%. Each video is a story. So even if, even if you look at a, a short video, you know, YouTube shorts are popular, that's a story. Every video needs a story to really reach that next level, to really break your niche and find the wide range of audience hence normal people that are just scrolling on youtube so it's very important how do you capture the story of these people what are the things that tactics that you implement that you would say you know th this is how i capture the, the the story of this person in a youtube short or a video how do you do it usually i'll try and kind of relate them to their hair so i'll say all right let's say billy Hasn't had a haircut in six months. He told me his last barber messed him up. Well, there we go. There's our story. His last barber messed him up. I'm going to come in and save the day. Mm -hmm. We're going to take Billy from looking like this to this. Simple as that. So depending on the problem my client comes in with, maybe it's hair loss. Maybe it's, you know, he just got a hair transplant, whatever. I could take that and kind of just flip it into a positive, feel good, satisfying story. What are the conversations like with these people as they come in? Do you already know you're going to feature them in a video? Do you talk to them before they come in? Or do you see them coming through the doors and you're like, hey, I'm going to ask this guy if he wants to be featured in a video. Like, do you explain, like, tell us that whole process. Gotcha. So it's a little bit of both. So I have a video day, um, typically either Mondays or Wednesdays each week, where I have people send me pictures of their hair from the Internet. Um, obviously, they have to be in the Philadelphia area. And I tell them if they come in for a video, the haircut's free. So I don't even charge them for it. Mm -hmm. Now, on the flip side of that, when I do have my paid appointments, which is about two to three days a week, if someone comes in with a lot of hair and and I'm like, mm, sometimes I'll just offer them the haircut for free. Like, hey, look, if you let me record this, you know, haircut's free. Haircut's on me. And do um, you, do you have to explain to them like, Hey, we're going to, we're going to kind of frame this as like you coming in here with a mess of hair and me kind of, uh, kind of tidying this thing up. Is that kind of how you frame it? Or do you have to kind of be gentle with it? Or what's the conversation like? Yeah, I have to be gentle because it's, it's tricky because hair is kind of tied to our identity. Mm -hmm. So you can't really talk about someone's hair without kind of showing their face. So insecurities can get involved. It's different if you're like 
if I was a chef and I'm just cooking a meal and making a video of that, it's different because there's no faces involved. There's no, you know, insecurities involved. So I definitely have to be gentle with it. Definitely. Yeah, I, I would assume so. Uh, because you're right. It is linked so much to our identity. People's hair means a lot to them. And if, if they're coming in and you're basically telling them, hey, this kind of looks rough, you know, we can we can fix this. Right. So uh, but hey, a free haircut's a free haircut. The way the, the way things are going up in price right now, mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, it's rough. So let's talk about vertical video YouTube shorts right now. You've done really well. I mean, you get, you know, hundreds of thousands of views on your vertical, your short YouTube shorts every, you know, every day, all, all throughout the month. Um, how have you implemented the YouTube shorts and how does how has it grown your channel? What kind of talk about that? Because a lot of talk here on this podcast and just in the YouTube ecosystem is that, you know, some people love shorts. They grow channels that way, but there's really no way to monetize it. Can, can you talk on that or speak on how you've used YouTube Shorts to grow your channel? Because you've done really well with it. Thank you. Um, shorts are kind of like a dessert to a great meal. You know, it complements it. Uh, I do know a lot of channels that are solely built on Shorts. Mm -hmm. uh, am I a fan? Not really. I'm not really a fan of Shorts. It has kind of altered the algorithm, altered the YouTube space. Um, because before you had, you actually had to put in effort for longer videos to actually reach people. And if your longer videos didn't do anything, guess what? You had no audience. So now it's kind of like a cheat code. You can use shorts to kind of reach a different audience. But the way I've, I, the way I've taken advantage of it, like I said, it's like a compliment. So shorts does reach a broader range and people subscribe fast off of shorts. They need to just need to see a few shorts. They look at it, they're like, "All right, I'm going to subscribe to this." Do guy. you do you think they use that subscribe button kind of like a like button? That that that's kind of what I've told people yeah. because I found that to be the case where you're right. It it takes more um, watch time, it seems, on long form content to get people to subscribe. You know, I do a tutorial channel, have been doing it for almost 14 years now, and my subscriber numbers that I get per day has gone down dramatically than what it used to be. Because people used to use the subscribe button, even on a channel like mine that's doing how to educational content for technology. Now, they'll just use the like button, they'll get what they came there for, and they're good to go, right? So exactly. ex explain that. Like, why do you think that is as far as, you know, people consuming the bite sized content? and then subscribing quicker? Well, I look at it like shorts is like you're scrolling most times. So when you're scrolling and you're like, oh, I kind of like that video. I want to see more. Mm. All right, I'm going to subscribe to that guy. Like you said, I agree. It is like a like button almost. It's like, I don't want to miss another short from this guy. I'm about to continue scrolling. So to ensure that I can see this guy again, I'm going to subscribe. Do you also agree that it might inflate numbers a bit, like it inflates the subscriber numbers on some channels that are doing both, right? Because you look at a channel and you look at their videos and you're like, well, man, they're not getting very many. Like a channel like mine, when I upload a video, people make fun of me. They're like, well, you only have a few hundred views. But what they don't understand is I I'm producing that video for a three to four to five year lifespan, right? For, for search. Right. I don't care about how many views I get first 24 hours. That doesn't matter right. to me, right? So for that being the case, I do believe these YouTube shorts have inflated a lot of channels numbers. Absolutely. Yeah. Like I said, I'm not, I'm not a fan of that. Like I I'll look at a channel, they have a million subscribers. Their latest video has, you know, 1.1 K views. And it's like, all right, but to each their own. I'm not here to knock anyone's style. I mean, if you're building an audience, because maybe they're building an audience to sell merch or to sell a product to a third party, and they're still going to make their money. So so let's talk about making money. Um, what are the monetization buckets for you and your YouTube channel that stem from the YouTube channel? Can you go through all of them? Maybe even if you're willing, give us an estimate of kind of what you're, what you're earning from the YouTube channel itself. Yep. So um, monthly right now, I'm earning about like between like 10 to 15,000 per month. Okay. Um, obviously, those numbers inflate if I get a really good video. Um, but yeah, but it, it opens the door for many other things such as like sponsorships. I'm sponsored by a few companies. Um, you know, they pay me also per video. Um, between like fifty, a hundred dollars, whatever. Um, and let's break let's break that down for a minute. So let's say let's say you make ten k in a month. Where where does that ten k come from primarily? Talk about the different kind of areas, like between like ad revenue, sponsorships, affiliate. Where's all that fit in? Um, that's just from YouTube, right? Ten, yeah, about ten to fifteen. That's from YouTube. 
um cutting hair that's more money obviously um but sponsorships not too much i don't do too many sponsorships i'm very careful with where where i kind of put my name in because i'm planning to drop my own product line so i'm very careful who i who i allow to sponsor me because you know it could come to bite you in the butt you know in the future what are your average view counts per day? Because if you're making like eight to twelve, eight to fifteen thousand dollars, the view counts have to be pretty good. And for the most part, the monetizable views are long form. So I'm looking at the tube buddy uh, kind of uh, thing on your channel. It looks like you went from getting a few hundred thousand to like here recently, like you're getting like a million, you know, five hundred thousand to a million views a day. What changed there? What kind of why the, such the jump recently? I have a viral short going around it, it went like ballistic it's like right now it's at 9.3 million wow and it's crazy because i'm not sitting here like strategically posting reels i mean not reels shorts it's just like yeah i already have it edited for instagram and tiktok i i'm strategic on there shorts is like all right i'll throw it up at 1 a.m let's see what it does <laughs> so yeah I love that. Now, when it comes to doing that and the YouTube shorts, are you putting a, a related video with it to kind of point it back to long form or what are your strategies there? I just started doing that because I think that feature is pretty new, right? Fairly new. Yes. Yeah. I just started doing it. It's been working. It's been working fairly well. So I'm going to continue doing that. Sometimes I even link a video that's not even related to that one because yeah. in reality, like we said, I post all hair content. So if someone likes this, more than likely they're going to like another one of my videos. Mm -hmm. Have you found that you're getting clientele from the YouTube channel, like paid clientele of seeing your stuff? Yeah, I've, I've, I've been getting that for years now. Um, it's to the point now where I don't, I'm not really taking new clients that much. Um, I don't plan to be cutting hair that much, um, like for money soon. I just want to kind of just do like the free cuts, which is YouTube. Um, yeah, I mean, if you're making that much money, right, like it just makes sense financially for you not to worry about the paid clients and you, you would be wasting yeah. your valuable time if you were in there just trimming hairs for like, you know, 50 bucks a pop or whatever it is, right? So for you, this is just the most valuable, you know, resource for you, which is time. So uh, I love that. Uh, as far as just the outreach of like TikTok and Instagram that you mentioned, what are your strategies there outside of YouTube? I know YouTube's kind of the main hub, but what else are you doing elsewhere? You got the website, you got the other places. Give us the whole rundown of kind of your strategy there. Gotcha. So my editor runs my TikTok. He solely runs that. Um, I think we're sitting about 60,000 followers on there. I kind of didn't really put a lot of effort into TikTok, but now I'm, I, I recognize its importance. Um, especially with me building my own personal brand of my product line that, right. you know, I'm planning to release soon. So other than that, I'm very strategic with Instagram. Um, so those are my three primary Instagram, YouTube, TikTok. I don't really mess with anything else. Do you just repurpose like all the vertical videos you do? Are they just the same for every platform or are you trying to change them up at all? I'll test them out on each platform, but sometimes I do have to tweak it just a little bit, like maybe trim it a few seconds, add. So YouTube Shorts, something I've been doing recently, I'll put a custom thumbnail in it. So I'll have to add an image that I edit, kind of Photoshop it at the end of the video so that when I post the YouTube Short, I can select it out the frame. That's interesting. Do you find that to be, does that make those videos perform better you think absolutely okay absolutely. so so this is interesting i've heard a lot of people doing this explain that you just did but in more detail what you're doing basically and correct me if i'm wrong is you're putting a a frame or the 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 thumbnail that you're editing in photoshop which is a vertical image right so you have to make sure it's framed perfectly can you tell us that whole workflow and like the sizing and everything just just for people listening yep so i use an app called pixar mm -hmm. and pretty much it's the size of a YouTube Shorts thumbnail is also the size of an Instagram story. So I pretty much choose that framing within Pixar. I could I just click Instagram story. I edit it, whatever, export it out, and then add it at the end of the video, and then export the video again, and then post it to YouTube, and then select that frame, and then title the video. How long does that picture have to be in the video? 
I put mine at zero point half a second. And it's so at the, I, it's at the very end. It's at the very end. Typically, I was doing a second, but now you can do it. I believe. Yeah, I put zero point five the last time I did it. But to be safe, just go a second. How do you edit your shorts? What are you using to edit your shorts? Is it that actual app or are you doing it somewhere else? So sometimes I'll do it on Final Cut real quick. Like if I'm grabbing, if the content is on my computer and not on my phone anymore, because sometimes I'll just upload it to my computer, I'll edit it on Final Cut, but I prefer to edit it on an app called InShot. It's on my phone. I-N-S-H-O-T? Yep. And then you just do, you do the image, you put it in the InShot, you put that bit, the, the, the image split second. I mean, at this point, they're probably already swiping up to the next video, right? So it doesn't really affect their viewing experience. Uh, I'm looking at that short you did, the best hair, the best haircut ever. Uh, you had this like perfect Afro from this guy, this, this great fade in the back. And then like, you had this perfect line with your trimmers, like that thumbnail. I assume you use that tactic there, right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So that's just, again, if you're listening to this, it's a great kind of hack uh, for your YouTube shorts of right now. We're not, I, I don't know why YouTube doesn't allow us to do this, but right now we're not able to pick our own custom thumbnails. I do believe in, in, in future we will be able to, but by, by using this hack of doing an image at the very last minute of second of your short and only doing it for half a second, this allows you, and you're able to go in right when you upload the short and you're able to go in there and select that framing, right? Yep. Yeah. Just when you're uploading it. Now, I don't know if you remember, but YouTube did allow us to upload oh, thumbnails. At some point they did, yes. But then yeah. they re they removed it. They removed it. Which blew my... I was like, why? I, I don't know what... I don't know. Maybe, maybe because there were so many... People were uploading so many shorts so quickly that yeah. the server could... I don't know. I'm not even going to guess. I'll sound ridiculous. <laughs> um, what are the what are the tools of the trade for you? Like We've talked about InShot, some different apps that you're doing. Like What are the, the cameras that you use, the microphones that you use? Because I've watched your videos. The audio quality is fantastic. The video is fantastic. So what are you using? Just your phone. Just my phone to yeah. record. Um, a lot of people are surprised by that. Uh, obviously, you see my videos... The clean background I have, that's a good tool. Uh, if you're in a barbershop and you want to make content, get a clean backdrop. That way, any person with their hair, any color of skin, it would just look good. But other than that, mics I use, I use the DJI, these mics. Are they, are those the square ones? Yes. Yeah, so the, the DJI square mics, you can attach those anywhere. I call them old school lapel mics, but you can call them whatever you, whatever you want to call them. Uh, but those work great. They allow you to capture the audio from you, the barber, right, plus the, 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 the pa I said patient, the, the, the client, whatever you want to say. <laughs> That's great. Um, what are you looking to do next? Like, what's the growth mindset for you? You talked about kind of uh, declining the amount of actual paid clientele you're doing for the barber work. But what's next for you short term and long term for the channel? Um, for the channel, I do want to document me also making my hair products also, you know, working with manufacturers. I think that'll be a cool process to show people that it's achievable to do. Um, but as far as the channel, I'm just going to rinse and repeat. We're going to keep doing this. And, you know, if you've noticed my videos, we've tweaked along the years. Like last year, the content I was making isn't the same as we're doing this year. Um, so each year the algorithm changes. So we're going to rinse and repeat. And when it when it's time to adjust, we make those minor tweaks and keep moving forward. Your thumbnails to me are some of the best things that you do. You're very good at capturing kind of what you're going to cover and talk about and tell the story of in that video. Um, do you have any, I would say that the method that you've used thus far is just like less is more, right? Just a big high quality picture of the client, of the person getting their haircut with maybe an arrow or something signifying where the problem area is. And then no text on the thumbnail, just, just bright, high color vibrancy, what are some things that you would say there about thumbnail creation? Um, thumbnails is all about psychology. So when you're scrolling on YouTube, um, each decision, we're making decisions each time we're scrolling on the YouTube homepage. It's a split, probably even less than a split second. Less, yeah. Psychological, psychological decision to where I'm either going to scroll or I'm going to click on this video. So I keep that in mind when I'm creating the thumbnail. I'm like, I need to create a thumbnail that people cannot not click. Mm -hmm. Like it's going to be, a, I need to create a psychological warfare in their brain to where 
I need to see this. I need to see it. I can't miss it. That is That's the that process. unbelievable. I think I have a, a show title for the episode, uh, the psychological reason as to why we click on thumbnails. I love it. Um, you do such a good job of just capturing just the essence of what you're going to see in the video. Um, have you ever thought about live streaming or like streaming your haircuts, doing Q&As for you know, things like that? Or is that something that you're not really interested in? I've thought about it. It's not something I'm too interested. I know they just released vertical live streaming, right? They, they did, yes. I might look into that. Might yeah. Look into that. yeah, that might be something that's especially how successful you are with the YouTube shorts. Um, what's uh, as far as the brand itself with what you're doing? Is there anything you're looking to do outside of like a course or uh, doing more website newsletter stuff like what are, are you looking into any of that? Um, I had a course. It was kind of like a bonus content. It was on. It was through Patreon. I didn't like it. Uh, it took away my focus from like the channel. So I ended up just kind of deading it. Um, not really interested in that. Like I said, it's, I'd rather educate someone in person. Like I do do classes in person occasionally um, where people pay me. Um, I set up some models for them, free haircuts and teach them how to cut hair. But as far as an online course, it's just not something that interests me at this time. I'm, sure. It may change. We'll see. What's something that you wish someone would have told you early on in your YouTube journey. Looking back now, you're like, man, I wish I'd have known that sooner. You don't need fancy equipment. That's that's what I wish someone, you know, when I started, I did start on my phone and my iPad and stuff, but I did go out, buy expensive equipment, all this tech techie gear stuff. And it's just, and at that time, my channel was doing the worst. When I had the best equipment, I had a mm. Sony camera. I bought it for like $3,000. My channel was just doing the worst. It all comes down to just keeping it simple, good lighting, and good content. People are going to watch good content regardless. Yeah, I think it's a trend we're seeing right now where lower production values and higher transparency and higher just like being real with who you are is is what's succeeding now there's always going to be the high you know quality of like what mr beast is doing and the people right. like that but for the most part on youtube right now i'm seeing a trend and i've mentioned this week after week here in the past couple of months that that just more openness more transparency that seems to be what's succeeding on youtube and you're right you can get so caught up in the latest and greatest tech and i am the worst at this i see these new you know flashy things i want the new microphones i want the new cameras but i realize that what people want is just good content, like good, honest content from people that they trust. And that's kind of where we're at. Uh, as we close this, the, the episode today, um, can, can you kind of leave the audience with something? Is there anything you want to leave the creators with kind of today that you would say uh, that maybe you wish someone would have told you? Be authentic. I think that's good advice um, that someone um, should hear. Just be authentic. Whatever you bring to the table, do that. So if you want to educate, and you're not that entertaining, do that. If you want to entertain and you don't want to be that educational, just do that. Um, I'm a very blunt person, so I, I talk very blunt in my videos, and I'm just myself. I'm authentic, so yeah, that, that's some advice I have. Yeah, don't try to be someone you're not. You, you know, yeah. you, you you can't fake it. They'll 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 see straight through the camera lens. That's uh, something. It. They'll sniff it real quick. Ken, thank you so much. Uh, again, you can find uh, him over at the fourth Ken four T H, not uh, the word spelled out, over on YouTube and all the other socials. Those will be linked in the show notes of this episode. Ken, you've been an awesome guest. Thank you again for joining us today. Thank you, Dusty, for having me. It's a pleasure.